that God is unchangeable and that his word is immutable. I certainly appreciate the <clears throat> opportunity that is mine to speak here today. I know last uh, year, uh, Eddie didn't pay the light bill. While I was up to speak, why, the lights went out, and I spoke uh, the entire time, except maybe the last five minutes in the dark. And when they did turn the lights on, I thought, now I'll have a lot of time to do some preaching. And you know, Eddie got up and said, time's out. <laughs> so I hope they put another nickel in the uh, uh, box out there for electricity. And uh, I may be blinded today. I look out and I see uh, the coat that uh, Joe was wearing, and uh, it's pretty red. And I understand uh, a few days ago that Dub McClish may have had the same coat, and he probably loaned it to Brother MacDonald. So I'm glad to be here and want to thank the elders for the opportunity of inviting me. And I want you to also know that uh, very soon that we're having a lectureship that is in March, March the 18th to the 22nd, and now it's time for you Texans to come to California. We need you, and we have a number of men in this audience that will be speaking. Uh, we uh, have Tom Waycaster, and we have Eddie, and uh, then my big friend back there, the African hunter. You might guess who he is, but we are going to have him to be with us. And so we're looking forward to a great time in California. Things there are a little more difficult today. It's hard to get people interested in the gospel. And in the barrier where I have preached so long, it seems that uh, some of the congregations are not now as faithful as they were some 10 years ago. And this to me is indeed something to be regretted. So we need you Texans to come out and give us encouragement and to help us as we endeavor to preach the gospel there. Today we're going to be uh, studying from uh, the subject, the fatherhood of God. And I'd like to, at the beginning of our lesson, to point out that there is one in heaven who answers to the name of Father. In Matthew 3, verse 17, a voice came from heaven when Jesus was baptized by the hands of John the Baptist. And that voice said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So God is the Father. And the word Father was many times upon the lips of our Lord and Savior. The first recorded words that we have of Jesus are found in Luke 2 and verse 49. I must be about my Father's business. Then in the very shadow of the cross, we find uh, Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Read about it in Matthew 26 and verse 39. O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Another scene in which the word Father came from the lips of our Lord was when he was upon the cross of Calvary. And we hear him say in Luke 23, verse 46, of which we have the record, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. What was God thought of in the Old Testament times? When we began to study in the book of Malachi, chapter 1 and verse 6, God was called the Lord of hosts. This means the Lord of battles. This means the Lord of armies. Thus, in the Old Testament, people looked upon God as a kind of a warlord. But since our Lord Jesus has come into the world, men now speak of God as love. Jesus revealed the tender nature of God. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8, we are told that God is love. Charles Spurgeon, a preacher who used to preach in London, England, preached to a crowd of more than 10,000 people on the Lord's Day. Through the week, he enjoyed going out over the countryside to see the beauty of England. And uh, one day, he looked over 
from a little hill, and he saw a weather vane that had these words on it, God is love. He was curious. So he went up to the farmer's house and rang the bell. Farmer came to the door, and Spurgeon said, Sir, I'm interested about your weather vane, the words that you have on it. He said, uh, the words are God or love. Do you mean that God's like the wind and changes his mind? And whatever way the wind blows, the farmer said, no, sir, God is love. And he is the same God regardless of which way the wind blows. God is love. We turn to John 1 and verse 18. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he hath revealed him. And in the King James, it says, he hath declared him. Since our Lord is come, men no longer see a cruel God of the Old Testament. Men looked at God as cruel then. And there's a reason for it. The children of Israel were to go and possess the land of Canaan. To do that, they had to fight the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Perizzites, and many other kinds of enemies. And thus it seems that God was delivering them from one battle after another, and he was called the Lord of hosts, the God of battles. How did the Jew look upon God? When the Jew came to think of God Almighty and the fatherhood of God, the Jew looked upon God as one that granted special favors for the Jew and for the nation. Consequently, the Jew, when he thought to the fatherhood of God, looked upon God. He looked upon God as a kind of a king. Now, you may be wondering now, why is it so important to know what God is like? Why is our subject, the fatherhood of God, so important? Let me tell you why it is important. If you do not know what God, God is like, then you will never understand the human and divine relationship. The human fatherhood is an accommodation of the divine. The divine is not an accommodation of the human. What is God like? So we begin to look at the fatherhood of God and we find that uh, something of his nature. Number one, we find that uh, God is a father. He displays parental affection, perennial love, and he has a disposition like a parent. Our parents love us, and they want to be good to us, and consequently, they from time to time give us gifts. These gifts may not always be good for us, but anyway, they in their blinded love want to show that they love us and they give us gifts. And we're told in uh, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7 and verse, nine, uh, verse 11, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father in heaven give good things to them that ask him? God always gives good things. While an earthly parent may be somewhat blinded in what to give a child, our Heavenly Father never makes a mistake. In James 1, 17, we learn that every good and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights. We have a good Father, one who knows what's best for us, and he'll give us even more than we ask. Matthew 6, 33 Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Think again of our heavenly Father. He is like an earthly father from the standpoint that there is a body of us. We have bodies. They need to be nourished and they need to be cared for. Likewise, we have minds, and those minds must be developed they must be uh, nurtured. They must be strengthened. But I want to tell you something. If God is your father, you're studying a new math. It hasn't been too long ago till our daughter was in high school. She came home one day, and uh, she was greatly disturbed. And she said, Dad, we've got a new math. They're uh, starting a new math, a new type of arithmetic. 
and said, I have to learn it. Well, I wasn't able to help her. My wife wasn't able to help her. We found a teacher that knew the new math. And uh, she excelled to the top 10 of her class, for which I was very thankful. But she was learning a new math. If God is your father, you today are studying a new math. What is that math? It is if you lose your life for God, you will gain it, Matthew 10, 39. You will be learning a new logic. We have a number of people who are very logical. Brother George D. Holt, I think, is a very logical man. Brother Roy Deaver, man among us, and Brother Lanier, and many others that I could name are logical men. But here's what uh, logicians tell us. There is a major premise, there is a minor premise, there is a conclusion. Well, then about the new logic. The new logic, the major uh, premise is love. The minor premise is kindness. And, of course, the conclusion will result from these, and the logical conclusion will be happiness. If God is your Father, you will find happiness going through love and kindness. So there is a body to be developed. There is a mind to be developed. Earthly speaking, the Father, the parent, is the ever-present teacher. Spiritually speaking, we have an ever-present teacher, and that is God, our Father. How does he teach? 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Also, our Heavenly Father is like an earthly father, because he maintains a sovereignty. But in our Lord's case, it is a heavenly sovereignty. Sovereignty means authority. It is our Heavenly Father's right and duty to exercise, that is, authority. Authority carries with it the idea of law and a firmness and control. I hate to see in an earthly family where the Father has lost his control. Children no longer respect and hear the parent. We're hearing some strange things in the world today. They're not new. But really men have been saying them a long time. That is, the church has nothing to do with your salvation. You can be saved in the church or out of it. You can be saved in one church or another. It doesn't make any difference. Just so you join one, one is as good as another. You know, when I hear men making statements like this, I know that they have set aside the authority of my God. There are a number of human institutions. The Democratic Party is a human institution. The Republican Party is a human institution. A denomination is a human institution. And a denomination is no more divine than a Democratic Party or the Republican Party. God, his institutions, did not establish them to be spiritual institutions. To be a member of the denominational churches today is not the equivalent of being a member in the Lord's church. They have different teachings and they have different rules and consequently they believe different things. And no one is authorized by God, our Father, to join a denomination. Neither is anyone authorized by God to be a member of the Democratic Party or the Republican Party. People just do not have authority from God to be members of those institutions. But one has authority from God to be a Christian. One has authority from God to be in his church. We read in Colossians 1 verse 18, the body is the church. Ephesians 5, verse 22, that Jesus is the Savior of the body. Then to be in the body is to be in the church. Being in Christ is a requisite to salvation. 2 Timothy 2, verse 10, salvation which is in Christ Jesus. Somebody said, well, preacher, how about the denominations? 
There are many of them, don't you think? They're all right. Now think about this with me for a few moments. In order to prove that denominations are right, you would have to prove that the apostles belong to different churches. You would have to show that the apostles taught different doctrines. But the man does not live that can show the apostles were members of different churches and taught different gospels. We find that they were together in Jerusalem on the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Jesus. After persecution came on the church, they were scattered abroad, went everywhere preaching the word. Did they stay together? They certainly did. In order to show that denominations are all right to be acceptable, you'd have to show the apostles taught different gospels. Did they? Absolutely not. They started together. They stayed together. And they preached together. They preached the same gospel. How do we know? Galatians chapter 1, beginning at verse 6. Paul said, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that calls you in the grace of Christ into another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Here is the picture. The apostles started together. They stayed together, and they preached the same gospel. But today, when I start preaching against innovations of men that men are trying to bring in the church, untaught positions, such as instrumental music, people tell me that uh, I can't preach against those things today. And I quote Second John, verse 9, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. They say you can't use that against instrumental music. Now John's talking about uh, the things taught about the Lord, teaching about the Lord, and not what Jesus taught. And we're hearing that today from so many corners of the earth. What about it? Is Second John verse 9 teaching the teachings about Jesus, or is it what Jesus taught? Let's go back to Matthew 16 and verse 12. And we read about the doctrine of the Pharisees. Doctrine of the Pharisees. Does anyone get the idea that this is teaching about the Pharisees? Or is it teaching which the Pharisees did? It is teaching that they did. Not teaching about the Pharisees. Pharisees' doctrine is what the Pharisees taught. Doctrine of Christ is what the Lord taught. The teachings of Christ and not the teachings about Christ. Then again, God our Heavenly Father is responsible for our existence. Being responsible for our existence through the new birth and when one obeys the gospel... He's added the church. He's a son of God. He has been born again. God is responsible for that existence. When you obey the gospel, he'll do his part and save you. And the more you work in the kingdom of God, the more you become like the Father. Take Jesus, for instance. Jesus said to the Jews, of which we read in John 8 and verse 42, he said, if you had known the Father, you would love me. You would love me. Look how closely God's Son resembled the Father. Sometimes I hear earthly fathers and speaking of their children, how they look like them, and other people referring to a father, maybe in a son, how the Son looks like the Father. Now, this literally is said of Jesus. He was like the Father. He was so godlike, so much like the Father in heaven that it was said of him that he showed us the Father, John 14 and verse 8. Even he himself said, He that has seen me has seen the Father, verse 9 of the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John. We need to resemble our Father. Again, there is the matter of discipline. Discipline is the right, the prerogative of a father. It is his right and duty 
to exercise. It is not his duty to exercise in the entire neighborhood. I'm a father, but I don't have the authority to go in my neighborhood and discipline all the children in my neighborhood. I'd like to. There are some children in my neighborhood who need discipline. It hasn't uh, been given to some of them. But I'm not their natural father. I only have the right to discipline uh, those of which I am the natural father and no more. Well, discipline belongs to God. We learn that to whom he loveth, he correcteth. You read back in Proverbs, the third chapter and verse 12. Yes, the Lord does discipline. And I'm sorry for a child who has not been disciplined and needs it. He's lost something. And so today in the church, I'm sorry for members who need to be disciplined that are not disciplined. You know, here is a forgotten thing. How long has it been the congregation where you worship where anybody was disciplined? We don't discipline people because we don't like them. That's not the reason. We discipline children because they need it and it's for their good. And there are people today in many congregations who need disciplinary actions taken against them because we love them, not because we hate them. And discipline still, after it's carried out, we must still love those people and seek for their recovery, restoration, and brought back to their Lord and their Father. Also, a earthly father gives protection. He wants to defend his children against something that would hurt them and something that would be evil. When I think of protection, I think of all the protection that we as members of the church receive from our Heavenly Father. We read then in Matthew 7 and verse 9, and uh, we can easily see that protection is brought about here, that God protects in other words, if a man among you, if his son asks for bread, would you give him a stone? If he asks for a serpent, or ask for, uh, in other words, if he asks for bread, you wouldn't give him a stone. If he asked for fish, you wouldn't give him a serpent. So if you, being evil, know how to give good things to your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give to them that ask him? We have a protecting Father. We're even told in the book of uh, Psalms, chapter 34 and verse 7, The angel of the Lord encampeth about them that fear him, and delivereth them. And when I think of protection, and how our Lord will protect, I move along to the 34th chapter of the book of Psalms, and down to verse 9. In other words, there is no want to them that fear him. I don't know how God all protects, but he does. I do not know how God provides, but God provides. There's a passage of scripture that I sometimes use, and I think that I've been perhaps the most embarrassed one time in my life by using the passage. It is Psalms 37 and verse 25. David said, I have been young, now I'm old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. I say this, I have never seen a righteous person begging food. I have never seen the church help. That is, someone that asks for food, begging of food, the church helping a righteous person. Now, this may hurt to some people. But this, I say, I haven't seen it. In California some years ago, there was a woman that stayed on my case. I just seemingly couldn't do anything that pleased her. And I'm sure she liked me. But when I'd go to take a vacation, she would tell me, now you can't do that. Why? Why, she said, the devil never takes a vacation. So I said, well, lady, that's why he's the devil. God doesn't want him to be happy, but I'm a Christian. And I'm to be happy. And Paul said, I say rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. Well, she'd been laying for me, and she got me. One day in a ladies' Bible class, I was talking about I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. I've been t I was talking about I've never seen a righteous coming to beg bread, the church helping one that I considered to be righteous. 
I saw her finger go up in the air. That's enough to make a preacher tremble when this particular woman put a finger up in the air. I tried to ignore that finger, but she kept it up there. And finally, I had to acknowledge that finger in the air. She said, uh, Joe, you said you've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. You've never seen the church help what you consider a righteous person. She said, how about Lazarus, a man that's full of sores, and a rich man's crumbs, he ate them, that fell from the table. She says, what about Lazarus? Well, the people in front of me couldn't see how embarrassed an ending is. We're already red. You have to get in the back and see our ears and turn pink. I thought and I thought, and there was a long silence. And I said, well, sister, I'm like David. I've never seen it. That's what David said, and that's what I say. I have never seen it. Then again, God our Father is wanting a homecoming. He's lonesome. He desires our companionship. And Jesus points us to heaven in John, the 14th chapter, in verse 1. He said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus points us to heaven. There are a lot of people I want to see. What a homecoming this is going to be. Just think about it. There will be patriarchs. There will be prophets. There will be apostles. There will be priests. There will be poets. There will be gospel preachers, elders, and deacons. Won't it be wonderful? What a homecoming. There are a lot of people I want to see again. A father, a mother who preceded me in death. I'd like to see Brother C.R. Nickel again. He was my fishing buddy in my teens. Brother Nickel evidently wanted an ending to guide him through those streams and hills in Oklahoma. And when he'd go fishing, he'd call me and we'd go. And he was fishing for fish, but I was fishing for another kind of fish. I was out in these little brush arbor meetings in Oklahoma in my teens. They shouldn't even let me be preaching back in those days. And when brethren paid me, I wanted to give it back to them. I figured they got cheated because they didn't hear someone qualified to preach. So I would bait my hook. And every question the brethren had asked me for the last five months, I tried to ask them all at one time to Brother Nickel. He just kept on fishing under that old straw hat. He blistered, but Indians don't. So uh, he had to stay under that straw hat, or I had to row over under a tree that had some shade because he had to blister. And, you know, he never answered my, answered my questions out while we were fishing. But when we were driving home late in the evening on those Oklahoma dusty roads, he answered every one of them. And I went back to preach in that little congregation where I was preaching at one of those brush arbor meetings, and they thought that kid was the smartest preacher they ever heard. Well, they didn't know Brother Nickel was my friend. And then later, I got to meet Brother Foy Wallace. You talk about a thrill, seeing Brother Wallace, and I remember him best when he drove that old black Cadillac that had 260,000 miles on it. If you want to hear a preacher, go hear that man driving that old Cadillac with 260,000 miles on it, and all of those miles represented preaching miles, going somewhere to preach the gospel. If it hadn't been for him, premillennialism may have taken the church a few years ago, but he almost single-handed saved us. I'll never forget that man. He received a black eye in Oklahoma City in the armory building, preaching to about 1,500 people. Came to California, and he had the jitters. He had to go to debate. A man by the name of Matthews, Anglo-Israel Kingdom. And so you can't imagine what he did. He's afraid he's going to get another black eye. I had to sit on the steps and look out over the audience, facing them, a crowd of about 2,500 people, because Brother Wallace is afraid somebody's going to run up those steps and give him a black eye. But you ought to have been there. You never heard such a debate in all of your life. Mr. Matthews, after he heard Foy's first speech, he said, I didn't know it was going to be like this. 
He said, I thought I'd make my speech and he'd make his. Then after that, Mr. Matthews goes out in the hall to get a drink every time he'd speech, um, give a speech, and he wouldn't speak again until Foy was through. So Foy, not having someone to look in the eye, he would just take his foot and reach out and pull Mr. Matthews' chair all over the platform. And then he'd make an argument and says, what does the chair say? Just as silent as the tomb. I'd like to see that man again. I miss Foy Wallace. Don't know about you, but I miss him. I can name a lot of others. Curtis Porter, old Uncle Rue Porter. I'd like to see those men again. And so my father has a homecoming, and we're all going to meet one of these days, patriarchs and prophets and apostles and preachers and elders and deacons and song leaders. Won't that be a glorious occasion? But how is God unlike an earthly father? We go to Matthew chapter 6, and we learn a lot about what God is like, our Father in heaven. We learn that he's perfect, and our earthly father is not perfect. And in Matthew chapter 6, here's what we learn about our Heavenly Father. He is our Heavenly Father. That's the difference between our earthly Father. He is the Heavenly Father. Matthew 6, 9. Our Father who art in heaven. Here we see the aboveness of God. God is high and lifted up. Isaiah tells us in chapter 55 and verse 9, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. What is God like? Let us notice more. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Our Father is holy. He's holy. He's not Mr. President. He's not the man upstairs. It's wrong to be flippant in our intimacy with God. Psalms 111 in verse 9, holy and reverent is his name. Going back to Brother Wallace again. I think one of the most irritated times, most distraught times that I ever saw him. He had just come from a, a congregation where a man, a young man, got up in front of the audits to lead prayer and address God as Mr. President. Foy still wanted to go give him a paddling. I thought he was going to look him up and go see him. He thought that young man needed some kind of a treatment that would call God our Father, Mr. President. God is our royal Father. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. He is our royal Father. We can't pray that portion of the prayer today. For the simple good reason, the kingdom has already come. Read Mark 9, 1. Verily I say unto you, there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Colossians 1, 13, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, hath translated us in the kingdom of his dear son. The kingdom's already come. And then again, we see that God is a God of providence. Give us this day our daily bread. Jesus, our Lord, when he was here, he told us about the birds of the air and the lilies of the field. That was his way of telling us that God cares. We have a forgiving Father. Forgive us of our debts. God is a forgiving Father. Second Peter 3, 9. He's long-suffering toward us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Our God is a just God. How just is he? He is so just as we forgive our debtors. It's wrong to be unforgiving. Peter asked the Lord, he said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Until seven times. Jesus said, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. That means just stay forgiving. Then our God is a leading God and a delivering God. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It was after Jesus prayed that he repelled the temptations of Satan in the wilderness. It was after Jesus prayed that he walked away from a crowd of Jews who would have taken him by force and made him a king. Friend, I don't have time to finish the rest of this sermon. Look at it in the book. But I like to close with these thoughts. 
if you obey the gospel and if you stay with the gospel, there'll never be another denomination upon the face of this earth. If you obey the gospel and know that God is your Father and that He is listening, your prayers and your songs are going to be in earnest and will be thrilling. Wouldn't it be wonderful to hear thrilling prayers? Well, we'll have those if people believe that God is the Father. And then if we're faithful unto Him, as long as we live, God will take care of us. I thank you.